Hey guys, we have a special guest at the tavern today. Today we have Ironside, Mike Braddock visiting us. How's it going, man? Hello, guys. Hello. It's good. Thank you for having me. How are you all? Good. We're good. Doing very well. Very well. Uh, September 18th, man, you've got a big match. Dream Pro Wrestling, JJ Garrett, Jeffersonville, Indiana. Talk a little bit about that match and how it came to be. Well, um, there's a lot of layers to that, uh, you know, because this is Dream's first show, um, and uh, I'm working or I'm I'm pretty close with all of the gentlemen that are running the show right now, and that really all came from a few of us wanting an alternative to wrestling in this region, um, because it's really bad right now. It's just not good, and uh, uh, even where I like, there, there's some other things to that, but we just well, and none of us had had an opportunity really that we thought that, you know, that we had been working for. So we were just trying to, you know, I, I know those guys, they're just, you know, they know better now that sometimes you got to create it on your own and, uh, lead, you know, that kind of energy is, uh, it's kind of cool building into or building up to a match with a young guy like, uh, uh, JJ Garrett, just because, you know, he's, he, he's, um, he's on the rise right now. And it's, um, I've had my rise in this area. Yeah. Like yeah. I've been around for a minute. <laughs> so, and most people don't even know that, like, you know, that, that's on me, I guess, but, um, I, I don't know, but, um, I will be an interesting test for him because I don't perform like anybody. I don't work like anybody. I don't fight like anybody that is in the business. There's literally no one else in the business like me. And I know he's out there working his ass off right now, working with a lot of people, but they, a lot of them do a lot of the same stuff. So right. I'm excited in my position as an older, older guy right now, um, who's been around longer than most of the people in the business at this point. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm very, uh, proud of how I was trained and the way I perform and the way I see that, uh, the way I see the art of it. And I'm excited to share that with young cats who I think have an, an amazing amount of potential like Garrett. I think, you know, I, I think everybody sees that in him and what he's capable of doing. So, um, I have some different layers and different things to, the way I um, get through matches and the way I compete that most people don't. And I'm excited to share that with a, a young performer like him. And then in front of a new, hopefully uh, a new fresh crowd that we can keep building upon for dream as well. So how, how did uh, talk a little bit about your just friendship or history with uh, truth Magnum and turbo Floyd from the outrunners. Uh, I've known truth longer uh, truth. Um, when I first started wrestling, Truth was one of the first people uh, here locally to just welcome me in. There was a crew of guys here: uh, Muhammad Ali Baez, Jamin Olavencia, James Long, who used to wrestle as Paradise, who now is a producer. Uh, Shot and then Truth Magnum uh, was one of them. Um, and we kind of just kicked it off and immediately i was doing nick dinsmore's class truth was coming back to do it again just to get reps in and stay fresh um and we we both knew instantly how much we cared about not only the business because i i, I at this point in my life i don't really care about the business back then i did but we cared about the business but we both really really cared about the art and performing and really diving into the truth of what we're supposed to do as professional wrestlers so I, that, that one tied us together pretty tight. And uh, ever since, I mean, countless house shows, countless other indie shows. Um, he's lived, we've lived together. Uh, we've been through more than just wrestling, you know, like uh, he'll be around for my kid who, who will be born here in the next year. So oh, congratulations, uh, man. thank you. Thank you very much. So it, it's a, that's how tight we are. And, and Turbo, he came uh, and he showed up in this area like you know, a few years back. And uh, I, it was right when I had gone back to wrestle in Louisville. I, I had been going to school and doing some other stuff. And I decided I wanted to kind of get back in the ring and kind of just do the thing again because I just really like doing it. And uh, Turbo was uh, here. We're wrestling here locally. And I knew immediately when I saw him how good he is. Yeah. You could just see him when he gets in the ring. As soon as he leaves the curtain, the man has it. He knows exactly what he's doing. And when he's trained, he, he gets – He's one of the most coachable people I've ever seen in my life because he's a real athlete. He knows what it means to be coached and corrected and guided and everything like that. And he takes it very serious. 
and he's just become an amazing performer. And him and Truth together are just I, I, it's one of the it's one of my favorite things. I'm not a huge pro wrestling fan at this point in my life, um, but and, and I may be biased in regards to these two, but looking at them, trying oh, to remove myself personally from them, when you look at them and you watch them work, they are special. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say they have something special, man. They look yeah, like I'm very them. proud of them for what they've been doing recently. Yeah. So you said you've kind of fell out of you don't care as much about the business now. Let's take it back to like the beginning of your love when you were a kid. I'm guessing when you were a kid, you liked pro wrestling. Oh, very much so. I so I told before I joined the military, or did anything. I I told my mom or I told my mom. Let me make sure I'm doing this right. Here we go. I told my mom that I was like, hey, mom, I'm not going to college. I'm going to wrestling school. That was like in middle school. And she was like, oh, well, oh, okay. So, and then all this other stuff happened. And, but, you know, I loved it. I loved it when I was little. Uh, I grew up on it with my grandpa. And uh, he uh, he passed away last year. He, uh, he, I mean, I, when, when I was little, we lived with him. My, my, my mom, me, my mom, and my sister moved in with my grandparents. And my grandpa was it. And he just would put me in the chair with him. And we would watch USWA and whatever else we could get through. If anybody was going to order me a pay per view when I was getting older, it was it was Grandpa. We watched <laughs> WrestleMania 12 together in his living room. Like that was the moment that I knew I wanted to be a professional wrestler. Was was that show? Um, wow. That all happened with him, uh, you know. So I, I a lot of that is a lot of my love for the wrestling business is tied to him too, just because it was something that we bonded on for so long, so incredibly long. And I'm really glad he he got to actually see me wrestle um, a few years back. But the uh, I, I loved him. I mean, there was really not much else. It was wrestling and basketball when I was a kid. That's, that's about it. That's too. Yeah. So you you hear that from a lot of pro wrestlers that their grandparents are the ones that get them into pro wrestling. And but who, when you were watching it with your grandpa, who were your guys? Who who did you like? What wrestlers were you gravitating towards? First one was Ultimate Warrior. I wasn't a Hogan kid. I was an Ultimate Warrior kid. That energy was just I, I, it was nothing like it. Yeah, almost um, wore wore your shirt today, man. <laughs> pretty, uh, pretty, uh, pretty soon after that, when I, because I, no one had to tell me wrestling was is what it is. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to use the word most people use to describe it, but no one had to break wrestling down for me. Yeah, I was just at one point I was watching and it just clicked, and I, but I still loved it, and I knew I loved it. When I when that happened, a lot of who I like changed. I became a really big fan of Shawn Michaels and Owen Hart. And then, like when uh, Ray Ray Mysterio showed up, and um, Eddie Guerrero, um, oh, man, I really liked guys that could do long form storytelling that wasn't repetitive. Right, yeah. and I understand. I totally understand how got certain people work. I, I completely understand the thought process and, and and the necessity for it. To be honest with you. But when you, I really, really appreciate somebody that can get in the ring and tell me if I watch them every night, Monday through Friday, I will see a different match. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's huge to me. So then when I started training, though, it kind of went back. I went back even further and um, I started really getting into guys like Luthez, Pat O'Connor, Buddy Rogers, uh, Carpentier, like that, that generation, because I thought to me, that is quintessential top of the line where the business was at its most prestigious, right? So that's and then it kind of it kind of morphed in that way. But I, but when I was little, I really liked the guys that I felt like I could relate to. I couldn't relate to any of the big guys. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And when I finally got older, and knew what wrestling was. I liked those guys that could move and made me believe that I could do it. Yeah, absolutely, man. And so you served in the military, but so did your your journey into be training pro wrestling training to be a pro wrestler did that come before the military or after the military no i I was planning on doing wrestling training for pretty much up and i mean up until like september 11th happened and then there was talk of like a draft and all this stuff and i was not listening to the right people at the right time i was not getting my right the correct information at the right time so uh i i genuinely thought it was the right thing to do was to go take part in in that this chapter of history, uh, which is technically, I guess it's the only thing that is redeemable for the experience is that it's my name. Like I'm part of history in that regard. But right. other than that, uh, it, 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 it was, it, it basically like stopped <laughs> everything that I really wanted to do. 
but thankfully, um, no, I didn't do any pro wrestling training before that. I did. I jumped into that to do that, and may, and then I was actually, you know, for the most part, I kind of figured that I, once I was in, that I, that was it. I was either going to die when I was over there, or I was going to retire. One of the two. It was kind of just what I, the conclusions I had come to. Um, then after getting hurt and everything, coming home, it really wasn't even clean cut that way. It took me a minute to dig myself out of a hole and get back to where I was a normal functioning human. And I met those gentlemen I told you about. I met Muhammad Ali Vaez. I met Truth. I met uh, James. I met Jamin and those guys. They looked at me dead in the face. From I was just training with them, really. I'd had a bad bout with drinking. I was coming off of that. I was just trying to make myself healthy. I was in the gym with them. And they knew I was a wrestling fan, but they also knew that I understood it. Right. By the way, I talked because I wouldn't talk to them like a fan asking them about dumb shit that we get asked normally. Right. Um, I'm talking, I, I was really genuinely intrigued by their performances and the breakdowns and I would watch their matches and things like that. And we all clicked off that and they, they, they told me straight up, they're like, you can do this. You, 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 this, this business, there is a spot for you here. And that was really Ali. Not only did he know what kind of heat he could get with me, but he knew he believed in himself as a performer that he could get me there. Right. But then he also just knew looking at me and knowing and watching me train and everything. He was like, no, it's, you, you, I mean, and now I know there's people that should never even touch the ring that have done it. So I should never even question myself, but, <laughs> it, but it was nice to have somebody as good as Ali back then, as good as those guys were as hard working as they were to look at me and they, cause they could have just fucked me up. Right. Yeah. And protected the business. They mm-hmm. had every right to, but they didn't. And that's, that, it's amazing. And now I'm here because of that. That's a big deal, man. That's, that's, to have people in your corner. Absolutely. And, yeah. Oh, that's huge. It's one of the biggest, that, that's one of the biggest, and for it to be genuine. Right. Yeah. So a lot of people like to get in corners and they're, they're in those corners holding out their, their, their cup, waiting for their pay, yeah. waiting for their peace. And that's not real. That's not the real thing. But these guys, I never once in my life have they put the pressure on me to owe them something. Right. They just did it because they knew it was the right thing to do and they cared about me and, and, and it's been reciprocated. I love all of them dearly. And I think they all know what I would do for them um, because they did give me a dream that I didn't think was possible. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I protect and, those guys. I'm very, very protective of those, of that crew. And it kind and of blossom too. If you remember the blossoms. Yeah. The blossom twins. Yeah. Uh, two of the best people ever in the history of the planet, but also um, if I did not have them in my advanced class, I wouldn't be the performer I am. So that whole crew just made it possible when you know, I didn't really even think I should even be in the ring after getting injured and doing what I did. Right. Yeah. Almost transcends into a brotherhood after that. I mean, that's, yeah. Most of us don't even really wrestle that much anymore, but we talk all the time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I follow you on Instagram and I think it's a very like inspirational you know, we haven't said like for our viewers that don't know, you know, you, you meant, you kind of alluded it, alluded to it. You got hurt in Iraq. Yeah. And the thing that makes this such a compelling, just inspirational story to me, and, and you kind of alluded to it, they helped you achieve your dream when you, you didn't think you could go into this wrestling school. There was an explosion that took one of your legs. Yeah. In Iraq. What? <laughs> Do you remember that day? And and I remember every second. Walk I, walk, I can walk you through. If I if, if if we could do it, I'd walk you straight to the the spot it happened, and I I'd, I'd give you play by play. I remember every second of it. Wow. Um, I we were coming back from mission. We were, were doing these things called uh, tactical checkpoints, where we were investigating and watching for we called them bolo vehicles. Be on the lookout. Vehicles that we knew had been being used for trafficking weapons and explosives. So we were doing that and we were on our way back. And unfortunately, the unit that we were working for, because I was in a small unit of scouts. So we got tasked to people a lot because we were so mobile. And the unit we were working for had a bad habit of making us do the same thing over and over again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Didn't want us to go on the same route over and over again. And that's we knew we shouldn't do that. But then but the military is so fucked, you can't say no. So. Yeah. Uh, we were coming back from that mission, and it had basically we 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 lobbed it up perfectly for them. They knew exactly how we were coming back and everything. They dug a bomb, an IED into the road. There was a transition in the path that went from 
you can see my hands like this is the asphalt and then right here is where it turns into sand and dirt so mm -hmm. like in this little meeting of yeah. sand and asphalt they dug into the sand underneath the asphalt so they could hide it as best they could and really smart and it's uh and on our way back they we had also been <laughs> we'd also been tasked to mark our trucks which is counterintuitive to everything a scout does yeah. so they figured out who was supposed to be in my truck that day they they didn't know he was on leave but they knew that my platoon leader was in that truck he was supposed to be in that truck because yeah. it said the numbers on it they figured it out so they went after my truck to take out our platoon leader and he was on leave but they blew the truck up it flipped up on its side what they had hit us with was uh, a few mortar rounds wrapped in propane tanks oh my god because they had hit us before and they didn't add any they, it was just kind of there were smaller explosions that did more vehicle damage and most of our guys walked out I mean, pretty much everybody walked out um a few guys with some uh, damage that ended up affecting them later but like it wasn't visually ca as catastrophic as what they would what you would want i hate to say it like this but as an insurgent fighting that battle they they want big stuff yeah you know what i mean they want to know the job got done right uh, especially because in that era that was right when social media was kicking off and they were starting to put that stuff on there you know so it was it, it was a commodity in that regard so they let they threw the fucking the uh propane tanks on top of it and that just basically turned my truck into a big fireball it melted it um i was the only survivor um there were three other gentlemen in the truck two two soldiers and an interpreter uh bradley best clint story and we and our interpreter jack that uh didn't make it out unfortunately um the truck the, the truck flipped and it trapped them in there and the fire between that and the fire they could not get out um but I, because i was in the gunner's turret even though i had lost my leg in the way the truck flipped i was the only one with a hole out and i that's how i crawled out um i crawled out my leg was mostly severed at that point but it was still kind of connected and i didn't really know it until i started to crawl on my hands and knees and then i realized that my i went to get on my hands and knees and i didn't get on my knee i just kind of fell over yeah. because it what you know it, it, whatever that's when i realized that that had been pretty my leg had been pretty much destroyed grabbed it kept crawling away um waited for the rest of we thankfully we had just crossed paths with our other platoon so they saw it immediately u turned and came back and were able to get like a fire blanket on me protect provide cover all that type of stuff got me back to um and we had to switch trucks at one point um but then got me back to the aid station i gave them all my information uh to like the chaplain and everybody because i didn't know what was about to go down they innovated me uh woke up in san antonio like that happened on august 4th i woke up in san antonio on august 6th wow so I saw on one of your posts that your first words after it happened, can you repeat what you said your first words were? It said my ass hurts. And then I looked around and I said, can someone go get me a Pepsi? <laughs> it's crazy. That's crazy to me. I man. was going to say, is that the, was the, that the inspiration? Yeah. For, the yeah. Pepsi tattoo. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of people think it's punk and I didn't even know who punk was at that point. That, that tattoo comes from when I got hit, uh, that craving came from a sensation I was getting like in between consciousness because I, uh, had actually, I, they gave me my purple heart cause they thought I was going to die in Germany and they didn't want to give it to me posthumously. So they hurt and gave me my purple heart. Cause I was in the, I was like basically in the middle of it. Right. right. And then I kicked out of that and they sent me to Texas somewhere in all that. I was communicating with my grandma who passed away when I was in basic training. Wow. Like there was just something there. I don't know what it was. It was just my image my brain was generating images of comfort i think yeah. that's what it was and one of the things it did and one of the things that i loved growing up was going over to her house hanging out and drinking pepsi with her she <laughs> always had big tall liter pepsis we talked for so long that it would go flat mm -hmm. but i still wow. drank it because i was going to waste my grandma's pepsi Absolutely. <laughs> yeah man <laughs> so my craving actually when i woke up I said that, and then they were like, "They, my mom and every the doctors were all looking at me like I was fucking nuts." I was like, "Yeah, if you can take the lid off and let it sit for a second, let it go flat." Wow! <laughs> so my body immediately went to her. Wow! It's man. crazy those connections. You yeah, know, it's and what like as soon as it's over, that's the first thing. Like that's it's all it's an unexplained. I think that's one of those unexplained phenomenons. Those connections you have when you're in those outer body experiences. 
I think it says a lot to how we should treat the people we care about. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Because uh, when, and being more genuine about who we spend our time with, because you don't know at what point it's going to save your life when your brain just needs something to think about. Right. That's a, and that's what was happening. It's a great way to put it that, to me. I've yeah. never really th- even thought about it like that, but wow. It's all, yeah. It's almost like a, a life, a life jacket being yeah. tossed in your For mind. Your consciousness. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you, you talked about when you came back, you had, you know, you had a hard time. I imagine just rehab and, and, and coming to terms with not having a leg and learning to rewalk and, and the prosthetic and all of that stuff and, and wrestling, you know, that when did wrestling come in? First of all, how hard was it to pull yourself out of, out of that hole you spoke about? And two, did wrestling play a part in, did wrestling help? you get out of that um i still think i'm digging out of the hole if i'm being honest i don't think it ever ends i'm just lucky enough to have um the people i have around me my beautiful wife my friends my family my mom all these people that just kind of help make it less they make it more they they, they shallow the grave a little bit do you know does that make sense like absolutely it's just not as deep um But it's, I don't know if necessarily it was wrestling that did it, but it was discipline and purpose. I think that was key. Wrestling has probably done just as much damage to my mental health as the military. Right. If I'm being, being for real like that, like as much as I love the art, um, I like, I've just been whipped like a fucking dog in this business. Right. And so I don't know if it's necessarily professional wrestling that did it, but the love of those guys that that got around me and those those women, mm-hmm. the uh, love of my friends that I grew up with that believed in it, um, getting to the gym to make myself healthier, and deciding that direction for myself, like choosing that purpose and not waiting for it to happen to me, I think those were the things that helped make it happen, like helped me get out of what I was, the hole that I was in before, like back then, or put me in another, I don't know, but it, it helps alleviate a lot of that pressure. And I, you know, I, I don't like to put it too much on professional wrestling or whatever specific medium or profession one might be attached to. Right. Cause if you're listening to this, the answer may not be professional wrestling for you. And if you're having a hard time, the re- like, and you're like, well, maybe it's professional wrestling. It may not be professional wrestling for you. Yeah, it may actually be just you needing to dial yourself in and work on yourself and give yourself this, provide yourself with enough love and compassion to work on something you care about and that welcomes you in it and speaks to you. You know, yeah. wrestling's a bit dangerous in that regard because it's show business and show business is real toxic and it's real <laughs> manipulative and it's real uh, tiresome. So I don't know if necessarily going to that route would say would alleviate any mental stress, but the path to get there, the work, the work, it, that that's, that's the pain relief. That's the anti-anxiety. That's the anti-depression. The work and the support is what, what helped. Yeah. The people, I, I feel like it's not the business. It, it was the people that you connected with that you had that common bond with and, and yeah. the process of the work that maybe that's helped supporting you. cast. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And that's no matter how I feel about the business, I always hold all of that close to, you know, like that very, very, you know, that's very dear to me just because that's the real thing. The, the superficial stuff of people cheering for me when you, when all that stuff, when wrestlers talk about the drug and the adrenaline, that's selfish bullshit, right? That's selfish bullshit because you want people to fucking care about you about you in that moment and cheer for you and make you feel like a hero. The real stuff that makes us better humans through this business is the stuff that happens between shows and in the locker room. Yeah. Yeah. Digging in deep and fighting in the trenches for people, speaking up for your, for your, for your crew, making sure people got food on their table, roofs on their head, shoes on their feet, rides to their shows. That's the stuff that's real. Right. The other stuff that's bullshit. (laughs) That's just, we just are lucky enough to experience that. That's that's icing on the cake of what 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 this is, and that almost is part of the problem, right? Yeah, 
I can totally so, see that too. You know, yeah. like not to you know that it's it's a weird thing to explain, but I'm I'm more appreciative and have more love for the things that about the business that no one saw. Right. The, the conversations the, around a blunt in my living room where we're just telling each other, the, believing in each other. Yeah. yeah. The conversations at the bar where we buy each other a shot because we just had a killer match. And we just, we just know that that happened because we connected as humans and we made ourselves vulnerable for the crowd. And we did that together. Yeah. That's, that's the thing, not the pop, not the cheer, not the merch, not any of that superficial bullshit. I, dude, I relate so much to that because I moved to Los Angeles uh, years ago and as a, trying to be a screenwriter and me and a bunch of my friends lived out there from where we were from West Virginia, went out there, met some cool people, but the business that show business you speak of was so toxic. But when I think back to those times, you know, you're taking meetings with all these Hollywood douchebags. But when I think back to those times, the things that put the smile on my face is sitting in our apartment, our shitty little apartment, yeah. building each other up and talking about, Oh, we're going to make it. Yep. That, those are, those are those connections you're speaking about. I relate to that so much. Yeah. I'm uh, I, I, th- I just, yeah, I think you just get so much more out of it when you think of it that way. Like, uh, cause it, it, cause what if things don't work out? Right. What are you going to do? Are you going to yeah. be spiteful? Yeah. Like am I, if, if, if things, Maybe I never get a break in wrestling. Like it, th- it, that is a very huge possibility. One, because I'm not chasing after anybody's attention, and two, they don't know who I am. So the likelihood of me blowing up and showing up on your TV screen on major ke- te- cable television is rare. You know, like that's that's rare. But I met my wife in the business. Yep. <laughs> so <laughs> that to mean I won. Yeah, like yeah. I did it. Like that's the those are the things you should be fighting for. The other the, like I said, the other stuff is superficial. So maybe, you know, maybe the business doesn't work out because of all that weird toxic shit. But I'm I'm married to the, my favorite person on the planet who's about to have a, my baby girl. And I have we have a nice house that, you know, sometimes we gotta struggle for and work for it, but we're doing it together, so it's fine. And just because I'm not getting cheered for on a weekly basis doesn't mean that. I'm one, one that I wasted my time doing it or that I wasn't good at it. It just didn't work out, but I got all these other things that came yeah. from it. These amazing friends and all this stuff that, you know, that, that, that frees you up from that pressure and allows you to kind of appreciate it for what it really is. Well, those are the type of things that make it all worth it. You know, you, you yeah. have a baby girl on the way that's enough in and of itself. You know, like that. If yeah. everything else went away, yeah, that, sure. that's the prize. That's it. That's the, that's the reason I went through all this dumb shit, anyways. Right. Yeah. Like that to pass all to make sure she doesn't do that. Right. But she can. That her life is easier and more enjoyable, and she's she's prepped for these idiots that she's going to come across. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, we pay. Our, that's what paying dues really is. Unfortunately, sometimes paying dues doesn't pay out the way you think it does. Right. Then that is what it is. You know. So when, when you started training and, you know, these guys kind of took you under their wing and, and believed in you, I don't know where, if it started in the beginning, but you trained with Rip Rogers, legendary trainer. Mm-hmm. What's that like? Cause he, he's notorious for being a hard ass and, and people love him for it, but what he didn't was take that? it easy on me at all. First time the news showed up, the news came to, one of my first times in his classes and he made sure I puked for on camera. <laughs> I mean, he, the reason I love the business, I don't see everything the way Rip sees it. I don't, but I love him for what he did for me. Yeah. Um, and the respect that he shows me now. Um, but the reason I love the business, the way I, or the way, the reason I love the art, the way I love it is because of the time I spent in his class and people can, ride him out and dog out his perspective and his, his thing. He, he probably shouldn't sh- say half the shit he says. And, that, and that's not for me to, that that's not on me to deal with, but I do know that he's right a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's whether you like it or not. He's a lot of the times when it comes to performing in the ring, he's right. Yeah. He was mentored and brought up, brought in by one of the best ever. Right. So, He's going to know. And he's 
he 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 rides that line of crazy and brilliance. So he and he doesn't have any reason to tell you the bad way because if he sees it the bad way, it makes him it pisses him off. Right. So he wants you to do it the good way because he loves it so fucking much. Yeah. And he's doing it, and a lot of times he's training people in ways that'll protect themselves and and make their careers last longer and not blow their wads in front of crowds instantly every week and have to figure out more dangerous, dumb shit to do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Like he, people don't, for some reason, people are adverse to that advice. And it's like, no, he's telling you one, this is how we really should do it because it makes everything easier on the show for everyone else. Two, if you want to do this for the rest of your life, quit doing dumb shit. Yeah. You know, like it, they, they, a lot of people just take that personal. It's like, no, he's just, he just is the way he is. He was brought up the way he was brought up. He has certain things about him that most people don't even know or understand, and they're never going to know or understand it. And that, and that, that's whatever. He worked. He made me. Yeah, I don't give a fuck how anyone feels about this. I'm one. Of, I'm the top one percent of performers in this business. I don't think there are many people that can tell stories the way I tell stories and make them people believe the way I can make people believe. In this business, I don't. I, there's very few people that I will put on my level. That's yeah. because of him, and I take him dead serious when he talks. When he talked about how to do wrestling, I know where it gets gray, and you can start taking artistic liberties. But I know what works, and that's right. because he showed me multiple times, multiple ways, through multiple de- generations. He had uh, thousands of hours of evidence to to back him up. And I know the other people he trained. And I like you can't tell me they're bombs. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, like it, I, I you know, we don't see it, we do not see everything eye to eye, but damn it, I would not be the performer that I am without him. The mixture of him and Nick Dinsmore together, it was it it it, it made I, I don't think I you know, maybe I would have liked a better situation professionally. In regards to opportunity, mm-hmm. but education wise, it doesn't get any better. It doesn't get any better. They they put me in a position to to work the way I need to work without someone making me do something I shouldn't be doing. Right. So what's the difference between what what's the biggest difference between Rip and between Nick? What do oh, you say? <laughs> Nick's way sweeter. Um yeah. <laughs> he's a sweet dude. He's a really nice cat. Uh he's way more quiet. Um a bit more patient, at least he used to be. I don't know how he is now, but I think he's, I'm pretty sure he still is. <laughs> uh, but Rick, Nick was basically like, um, he's the precursor. He's the setup to Rip because Nick's a Rip guy. So he's kind of warming you up for that environment a little bit. And then <laughs> he tells you it's about to change. <laughs> yeah. And then you go with Rip and it changes. But you wouldn't be able to, without Nick, building those foundations rips wouldn't have made as much sense. Yeah. Right. So it, I, I hear a lot from the guys, you know, when truth and them were talking about rip, he's a storyteller, man. And, and I can tell that his students really, they have an affinity for that in ring storytelling and psychology. It's not just about moves for moves sake. It, you're telling a story. That's what we're supposed to do. Yep. That's what we're supposed to do. We're, if we were still in the early 1800s, positioned at the back of the carnival, putting on our shows, we, no one would give a shit about how much, like, if, if they got, if they saw this one dude do the same thing, the same miraculous thing over and over again, they'd find out it wasn't that fucking miraculous. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> yeah. It's true. And if you see that guy do it and then another guy do it and then another guy do it and then another guy fucking do it. And then that, you know, like what, there's nothing special about that, but things that have always stayed true is the hero going on the hero's journey. Yep. Yeah. That never changes. And that doesn't have to be the, the, the black and white cut and dry, good guy, bad guy. This is just the, this is just how you tell stories. The hero isn't always a good person, but it's just a matter of you put people, you put them down a path 
and you gradually do things to them that build them up and explain to the people viewing them who they are. And through psychological means of repetition and cycling back, cir circular storytelling, you manipulate the fan's brain yeah. into coming back over and over again, buying into these people, all these things. It's the same way, th this is the, Rip tells wrestling like Tolkien. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Everyone else, that's fucking Dragon Ball Z. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they, they're all they're excited for is the, the fight in the episode that lasts 20 minutes through three commercial breaks where all they're doing is ah, and hitting <laughs> like that type of shit. <laughs> There's nothing there. Like, come on. But if you go and you read, um, it's not even Tolkien, but any good author, any good, not like novelists. It's all of these little layers that sometimes yep. you don't even know are coming. Yeah. You know, like in, in wrestling where Hulk, Tolkien's talking about the grass and the flowers in the Shire for wrestling and us, when you learn from Rip, that's the lockup. Yeah. The lockup isn't something that happens by default. That's the first sentence of your story. Right. Yeah. And you see, you see fuckers that they don't even stay in the, in the lockup for more than a half second. And they're going into a spot. Now, all power to people that are athletic and do whatever they want to read. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not, okay. Right. I just, I watch movies, I read books, I watch shows, and, I watch, and I've done wrestling. It's all the same shit. Yeah. Yep. It's all the same shit. Yeah. And storytelling is storytelling, no matter what. So when you learn, and Rip tells you, Rip breaks it down because, and it, it gives you so much more to work with. It gives you so much more to work with. I don't have to be in the ring every single day figuring out a new move and a new way to drop someone on their head. I don't have to because I'm going to get in there and make you care about the fact that I got punched for the first time in the match at the 15 minute mark. Right. Yeah. Right. And that, and that guy's, you know, like that, that type of stuff. That's where that's, that's where Rip gets you. Rip has you looking at all of the details about everything you are as a performer. And that's why, like, I tell people sometimes, I'm like, I'm like a method wrestler. This isn't, I can't, I can't, uh, it's real when I'm doing it. Right. Yeah. It's real. So if you want to do unreal shit, I'm sorry for you. I can't, I can't help you. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. not my, like, that doesn't make sense to me. Uh, my phone is vibrating and it's turning my, my mouth. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, let's keep doing that. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's, that's one of the things I love most about, you know, learning from rip is the fact that I, 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 because I, I do love all that. I grew up my first, the first book I ever really read the first novel that I picked up as a kid. It wasn't some like little kid book was, uh, the Hobbit. So that's my standard of storytelling. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's, been, it's hard to match that, but yeah. that's what it is. And then now when you do wrestling long enough, you realize that, it, that that's, it's, you're doing this. I'm doing the same thing. I'm, you're watching me march from the Shire to Mordor. If, in that nine month program, that's what you're seeing. Yeah. So I love yeah. that. Man. It's such an interesting, but you never hear it, but like that either. And that's, and, that, and it's, it's so true. Like, the storytelling aspect of it. It's so true. Take us on that journey. That yeah, and I, and journey. even the people that are, excuse me, I got to put my leg on for a second. Um, I'm going to have to grab my charger, but even the people that love the fireworks, they want the storytelling too. They just don't want to admit it. Right. Yeah. And they right. don't They have time. They don't know it. And then by the time it happens to them, they're like, Oh man, it's <laughs> like, you know, like they, they, everybody, they say, and they, they, they go crazy for these big dangerous spots off the top rope to the outside of the ring. But then for some reason, when punk and Cena tell a headlock story at SummerSlam, everybody loses their fucking mind. Right. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> yeah. That's probably what I appreciate the most from learning from rip is that he confirmed all that stuff inside of me, you know? Yeah. That that's... all the stuff that I liked, all the, all my heroes growing up, all that, all that stuff. He uh he told me like no this is this, this it's real here too, right right. Now you you talk about when you were talking about 
kind of coming out of that hole, uh, still being in that and working your way through it and it being the journey, putting in the work. I see that, you know, it's not just wrestling. You're, you're doing jujitsu. I see you sparring on the bag. You've taken up making pottery, which is awesome. I love the art side of that. That's so cool. So like, you seem like someone to me that's almost like kind of a renaissance man. You have your hands in a lot of different stuff and you're, you're staying busy and keeping your mind like interested in things. It's uh, th- there's a lot to that. Um, a part of it is. I, yeah, a bit like that renaissance vibe. I just like a lot of things and yeah. I don't like not doing them. Yeah. And I'm lucky enough to be in the position that I'm in where, like, you know, if I want to pull the trigger and just start pottery, I can do that. It, it works out. Um, but some of that, too, is still searching for purpose and a, and a, and a place, you right. know, because um, I have always been a competitor. I've just never really not to get too like I'm not therapy on you or anything like that. But this is something I'm really working through now, especially coming towards having a kid is. I didn't really have anybody in front of me all the time as a kid really showing me and pushing me into these things that I knew I would be good at. Like I would have been a really good wrestler as a kid. I know it now because I can do it one legged. Yeah. Right. At 35. So my brain would have accepted it back then. Basketball was the same way. Um, I just didn't have anybody to really, because a kid needs someone to, uh, give them that compass and show them the way and believe in them and, and let them in and, and show them, keep, keep putting them in, in, in drive mode to let them keep working towards what they want. And I, I didn't really have that as a kid. Um, and it's led to, you know, now I, I'm filling in gaps. This is all stuff I should have done a long time ago. I gave up a, lot, a big part of my life because of the injuries and everything like that too, because of the military. So I, I, I want all this stuff that I should have done back then. I'm doing it now. And I especially want to be able to do it, do it well enough to where when my daughter is old enough to try it, dad knows. Right. Yeah. You want to throw a pot? We can throw a pot. You want to <laughs> learn how to put somebody in a Kimura? We'll break their arm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like it's whatever you want to do. And, and, and it gives me, I could either sit stagnant, hope for the best or just do the things that genuinely spark joy inside of me and that build me up that are good for me, that put me around good people and, and, and run with that. You know, I love jujitsu. I love grappling. I love fighting. That's probably why I still, I joined the military too. I was more inclined to the idea of that heroic fighter situation because I liked combat. Right. And I know that now I like being punched. I like sparring. I like rolling. I, I, I don't take any of it personal. Like I, I love that whole thing. Um, but on the flip side of that, I also love getting really high and being really quiet. So <laughs> yeah. that's why things like pottery are really cool, <laughs> you know, <laughs> in that regard. So I, you know, it's uh, some of it's a bit of a mental health thing to make sure I'm um, giving me my giving myself uh, some things that maybe my heart and soul missed out on. Right. But then also, like I just think this is the way humans should be. Yeah. I don't think job most of these normal jobs are bullshit. Um, there's just too much cool shit in the world to not experience. I've seen some really horrible stuff and that I deal with and account for every day. I hopefully, um, I guess really for my own sake, I just try to balance that back out by putting things like, um, honesty and creativity into the world. Man, you're, you're speaking my kind of language. Like I I relate so much to what you're saying. Um, what you said, you watch a lot of, you know, TV shows and movies. Like what's some, what are you watching right now? What, what, give us some recommendations for some good shows, good good movies (laughs) on my TV right now is Chris Lee knows best. So, uh, (laughs) no, uh, I I don't really, I'm not a big, sometimes I'll jump into a series, but, um, a lot of times I watch what I like, uh, Oh, Titans. I like Titans right now. Yeah. Uh, on HBO Max. Uh, I've, I'm always, I can always fire up Game of Thrones. Oh, um, yeah. Because I'm a, uh, that it's, yeah. Uh, 
we're a big Game of Thrones family. We cosplay at all the rent fairs. I built a, a full size Iron Throne for my wife that sits out in my driveway. That's awesome. Uh, so. <laughs> I mean, we're big nerds for that, so I can fire that up pretty much anytime I want. Um, what else? There's something else I'd buy, I'd put on recently. I binge through. There's almost too much now. I can't really wrap my head around it. Yeah, there's so there's much so stuff. So much out there, man. Uh, honestly, one of my favorite things over the last probably year and a half or two years was The Last Dance. Oh, I love so The Last good. Dance. Um, and of course, I love all of the Marvel shows, all of the Disney Plus shows. I'm a big Winter Soldier guy, so I loved Falcon Winter Soldier. But damn it, Loki was so good. Yeah, yeah. It was so good. And I love the mosque. The WandaVision was great too. Um, I'm ex- these what if episodes are great. I love that stuff. Um, yeah, and I just kind of I don't watch the normal shows that people watch usually until after they're done because I really like to watch them. I'm kind of the same way with comics where I wait until the trades come out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it just blows yeah. through the whole thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's uh, it's one of those things. Uh, been gaming a lot recently too. Been on Red Dead and stuff like that a lot. Things Red like that. Dead. Awesome. Yeah. That, so, one of the last things I want to ask you is, what was it like the day you found out you were going to be a dad? Ha, ah, man. Uh, it was so funny because I didn't know I could. Um, you know, you have an explosion that happens underneath your feet. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm, I'm physically and most for most of them, I mean, everything seems to look and function fine, but I, it did take some initial damage. Um, so and, and, and through the and that stuff, all, just you never know what your body's going to be able to do. And after trauma, I've right. been so hard on my body that I didn't know if I was even possible. And I, I was just actually starting to gear up to talk to my primary care about a um, uh, fertility test and all that type of stuff. Um, we had been going through the last year and a half. We both lost our grandpas who we were both really close to um, just things. It just, it wasn't something that we were really thinking about a lot. And it was not, you know, it was one of those things where, uh, there was absolutely no plan for it because it, it got to it got to a point where we didn't even think it was an option. And then she came home one day and <laughs> within 30 seconds, less than that, probably. She was like, hey, how you doing? What you been up to? And I was like, I said, whatever. And then she was like, OK, yeah, I'm, guess what? I'm pregnant. <laughs> oh, holy <laughs> shit. Wait, what? And my first reaction was to make sure she was good. Right. Because yeah. that's. I can't imagine what that feels like. That's just, you know, like, I don't know how she wants to handle it. Like I, I'm very, I'm very matriarchal. If that's a real word. Yeah. Like yeah. I, I believe in female leadership and them captain in the ship. And then we just kind of do grunt work and stay the fuck out of the way. <laughs> um, yeah. So I was just making sure she was good with it. And then I, I knew when I knew she was good with it, man, it's just, uh, I might get emotional thinking about it, but. You go from shit. You go from taking part in something so destructive and you know how to do all these bad things to people. And then it you just get this opportunity to write it. And show this new soul what the world really is and what it can be. And have this amazing opportunity to build life. Because I, uh, this is the first time I've talked to you all, so I didn't really expect to cover this and get this deep on my end. But um, I beat myself up a lot especially with what's going on right now. Right. Yeah. I don't think being in the military was anything to be proud of. I genuinely yeah. don't. Yeah. And I, I, I didn't do shit. Uh, 
nearly as many. I mean, I don't know. I don't have nearly as many uh, gruesome memories that I perpetrated on anybody as most people do. But I still hold myself fully accountable for it as best as I can. So I'm really, really appreciative at the opportunity to do the opposite. Right. Because yeah. I know this girl is going to be better than I could ever be. And I think that's maybe the only thing I can do to make myself feel better about things that I've done um, is to use, maybe get the opportunity to finally use all of it in a way that actually builds someone up. And that's yeah. what it's all about, man. And what, Super. what an, what an inspiring dad she's going to have. Uh, mm -hmm. Just do my best. That's all. Yeah. yeah. That's I appreciate good. that. Definitely, yeah. man. We appreciate you sharing that. That's I know that's tough, and we appreciate you sharing. It's for sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I thank you guys for asking it. I actually, this is one of the better podcast interviews I've ever done because they, you, I mean, it's just, you know, I actually just had this conversation with the news about how do people talk to veterans right now about with what's every, with everything going on, right? You know, uh, real conversations and listening. Yeah. Like, yeah. I appreciate you all not asking me questions just so you could tell me your answer. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Uh, that weird. happens a lot, especially with wrestling podcasts. Guys, most of these guys that host podcasts were just wrestlers that never were. So they're just trying to get all their shit in on a, in an hour long podcast on other wrestlers. And it's like, yeah, that's the, yeah, it's obvious to me when it's happening, but yeah, they're trying to prove how much they know. I'm usually pretty skeptical about doing this. I probably, I really only did this interview because truth asked me to, and I, you know, and I wanted to help out as much as I can, but I really appreciate you guys uh, being cool about everything and talking the way you did, just having a genuine healthy form and open discussion where I didn't feel like I was, uh, <laughs> proving myself or having to convince you all of information or something like that. Oh, man. You know? Absolutely, man. We, we, I'm just fascinated by people's journeys from all walks of life, not just pro wrestling, but yeah. uh, la last question. We, we ask everyone this question, kind of a fun question to lead, leave the show. You're, you're making towns on the indie wrestling scene. You're in a car. You can have any three wrestlers in that car with you, alive or dead. What three wrestlers are you going to be making towns with in that car? Truth Magnum, Turbo Floyd, and Jamie Olivencia. Perfect. Perfect. I love the answers that just come so quick. Yeah, man. you just know. So yeah. they're my boys. Why? I don't. I, um, all these, <laughs> most of these dudes we like growing up, growing up, are pieces of shit. <laughs> just, just, they just are like don't meet your fucking heroes in wrestling right so i if i'm going if i'm making towns that means i'm doing business and i'm getting paid and i want my fucking boys there too that's that's how i see it oh, yeah, that's man. awesome that's one of the more honorable <laughs> responses we've ever got that might be my favorite response we've ever got man i love it <laughs> love it so mike uh let everybody know where they can find you on social media and all that good stuff I am only on Instagram at Ironside Mike Braddock. Um, you won't see much wrestling unless I am actually wrestling. You'll see a lot of pottery and maybe my dogs. Uh, but that's it. And, and, and then when I go on vacation and I want to show it off. But that's about it. But yeah, if you want to follow me and keep up with me or you have anybody, if anybody has any questions, um, Ironside Mike Braddock is the easiest way to get a hold of me on Instagram. Awesome, man. And people can find you going up against JJ Garrett, September 18th in Jeffersonville, Indiana for dream pro wrestling. You guys make sure to get your tickets for that. Go check it out. There, there's a lot of great stuff on that card that night. So it'll be worth it's a great card. And if you've been wanting good wrestling in Louisville in this Louisville area, and you're really willing to put your money where your mouth is and support that and get us the fuck away from these, uh, crack dens, and fucking OVW, yeah. support this company. Support Absolutely. this company. This is coming from an OVW guy. Fuck <laughs> that place and fuck all these other weird spots where everybody's just making shows with their goddamn tax break, whatever, tax, whatever, <laughs> yeah. uh, return. Yeah. Fuck all that. This is a real promotion. 
ran by the boys to give people opportunities. We are at the arena now. Dream is at the arena now. The plans are bigger. They are way bigger. So it's this is one of those ones where uh, if you really do believe in people and you believe in wrestling, please support Dream Pro Wrestling. Support Ted McNaylor, Truth Magnum, Turbo Floyd, me, all these men and women on this show because this is a genuine shot at people that are, that are trying to make it for themselves. We are not – most of us are not welcomed anywhere. We've tried. We have genuinely tried. And no one wants us. This is a misfit promotion. This is an outlaw promotion. Yeah. We are making this happen for ourselves. So if you it. genuinely support that and you want new wrestling in Kentuckiana, please come to Dream Wrestling. Endure that Jeffersonville Arena for a few shows. Help us get out of there, and we will move forward, and it will be so fucking cool, I promise. I got all the faith in the world, and man, it looks like it's going to be a great time. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank well, you guys for having us. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Mike. We'll uh, we'll let you go, but again, hit me up anytime. Appreciate you coming on the show, man. For sure, for sure. Hit me up anytime. Hopefully, we can do it again soon.